To me, there's nothing that quite matches the anticipation of a start of a Grand Prix. Not, not many people thought it was a good idea. My old man, especially. I, I just had this continual belief that if I keep putting, you know, 100% of my effort into pursuing this passion, then it will happen. You've got to go out there and fail uh, sometimes. Um, for me, failure is the greatest teacher. And there had to come a point where I had to make a decision about what I valued more, what made me happier. There are so many opportunities in the world. If you like social media or a race team's social media, what, what is the secret of commentary? Okay, I'm gonna give away the trader secrets here. But for me, it comes down to... Chris, it's lights out and away we go. What does that evoke when you hear those words? Oh, what does it invoke? Um, to me, the, there's nothing that quite matches the anticipation of a start of a Grand Prix, is there? I think the only thing that comes close is a penalty shootout in football. Yeah. And that's coming from somebody who doesn't really enjoy football um, all that much. But as a, you know, a thing to watch from a sporting point of view, for me, those are the two best things out there. The start of any race, really, particularly like a Le Mans 24 hour. Um, but for a Grand Prix, um, especially, there's that anticipation that where it feels forever between the fifth light going on and the lights going out, where just anything is possible. And yeah, when we actually get underway, it's just, it, it's thrilling. I absolutely love mm. it. It's, yeah, brilliant. It's, it invokes you know, happiness to give a yeah, short yeah. answer to your question. <laughs> It's like about humans' anticipation. Like you know, there's, there, we, we're always looking for something else. We're looking for something more. And I think you know that that's what set the lights going off. And because you never know who's going to crash into who, what's going to happen in turn one, depending on the track. But I think when you look at a race, it's like yeah, you, like you say that there's nothing mm. between that fifth light and it going off and going and happening there. True. When Norris jumped uh, Verstappen at the start at Silverstone, I mean, I jumped out of my seat. Mm. It's phenomenal. It's just it's just little stuff that really makes you know motorsport what it is because again football you know penalty shooter you, it's you diving you're moving around like you know, no one actually really knows where the ball's going in the same way no one no one no one knows where the cars are going. I think it's interesting to have that. Yeah. Um, it, that is it's an interesting insight we pick up from motorsport is that you know the anticipation. But obviously that's commentating what you do now. But if what people want to know how you started though, what what really ignited the passion for cars in the first place? Where did this love of of racing come from? Um, so probably my old man, um, yeah. a lot of people would answer the question to say my answer is a little boring, uh, unfortunately, but, uh, it was actually motorcycles where yeah. I started out, um, because my old man had a motorcycle. He would have me on the weekends. We got the bike, we'd come home, watch MotoGP together. And that was, oh, how old was I? Maybe, you know, it's like six, seven, eight years old. Um, and that was, for me, was the first passion. I didn't start watching Formula One until I was 13. Yeah. Uh, so in, in that sense, quite a, quite a late bloomer, uh, actually. But uh, once, once it got going, I, I, I realized that I didn't want to work in anything else. I realized that I had a real passion for this sport and that I would try my hardest to find a job in, in that space. And I was a decent writer. Um, so that's where I, I started. I, I started out in journalism. I then moved into PR and then to uh, broadcasting. And mm. I, I found that a lot of the skills were quite transferable. Um, no, more so from journalism to PR. But in when I was working in those spaces, I ended up, you know, becoming friends with a few broadcasters. And they basically taught me everything I know about broadcasting now. And I've taken those lessons and applied them to what i do now yeah and were there many kids that are into motorbikes in europe when you were sort of that age was that was that a common interest no no <laughs> god no not at all so even when i was like a teenager watching formula one that was niche so mm. motorcycles definitely not um when i was at school there were two other people in my year group who liked formula one and uh, one of them, he was like half Spanish. So he was a Fernando Alonso fan. And this was when he was at Ferrari uh, yeah. ne nearly winning titles. So I, I used to prod him a, a little bit just for just for fun, because obviously I wanted Lewis to win uh, titles back then. But uh, it, it seems so crazy now that Formula One's now become this mainstream mm. um, sport that I think a lot more younger people are talking about. And it's a lot more 
common to you know have an argument about who your favorite formula one driver is in the playground rather than you know who your favorite football player is you know those conversations yeah. are still happening but before it was like the only conversation that was happening and now now having uh the formula one conversation as well it's it's great i i'm i'm happy to to see that yeah no, was, I, when i was you know, I, was, I was a kid and i was i was always obsessed with cars like it was never not a moment i was like you know oh this new alfa romeo has come out or you know back when alfa romeo were interesting um but there we go <laughs> and you know that this new alfa romeo has come out or new ferraris come out and you know i gotta really speak to one person about it and you, you find yourself i don't know i was trying to fit in with people so i you know pretending to like arsenal as a football team just to talk about it with people because i had apart from that nothing to talk about apart from you know, what you did on the weekend and stuff was it was it a similar experience for you growing up chris was that was that what it was like for you or did you be happy to talk about bikes to people that didn't know a lot about bikes yeah yeah there, there was there wasn't too many people i would, I would talk to my old man about motor gp mm. um but I, I remember the first like friend I made uh, who also liked bike racing, and it was through Twitter. Um, and it's it's been one of the longest standing friendships I've ever I've ever had actually. Um, and we ended up uh, we ended up writing together in uh, in, in in autosport mm. uh, for uh, for a brief time when we were both you know, young writers on their little sort of junior writing program, and um, and and we were friends because we shared a passion for for motor racing but particularly motorcycle racing and um that was that was nice having having somebody else to to talk to about that because there weren't there weren't many i think even in the motorsport world you know there's a a much smaller percentage obviously of people that you can talk to about motorcycle racing compared to formula one I mean, even even compared to endurance racing yeah or you know maybe maybe even formula e um maybe yeah maybe that's just my own slightly distorted view of uh of of what the motorsport world looks like but for me there's there's a lot less people that certainly i can talk to motorcycle racing mm. about compared to anything that's on track yeah speaking of going on track you know your career you know i, I like to think is a track or a road because you know it's, it's where i like to visualize it and for, you know when it came to you know you mentioned earlier you, know, you only wanted to work in space motorsport you know this is this has been anything anything you wanted to work in how did you go about you know finding a job you know were, were students were not students were teachers supportive at the time you know what was the careers advice you were given around oh i want to do cars whatever that means racing what was mm -hmm. that like hmm as there's a humming um, yeah safe to say every not not many people thought it was a good idea um my old man especially um oh, wow. okay. doing that typical whatever typical fatherly thing of um just wanting what was what was best for me and me not wanting to shut down opportunities just because they were not a yeah. thousand percent what i what i wanted but i i just had this continual belief that if i keep putting you know, a hundred percent of my effort into pursuing this passion, then it will happen. Uh, and that is basically what ended up happening. So when I, uh, left, uh, sixth form and I picked up my A-level results and two weeks later, I was at Donington park doing, um, formula E preseason testing, uh, the second year okay, that they wow. were there for, uh, for, for a website that I was, um, sort of writing on, um, nothing nothing like major because it all started I, I like started a blog when i was 14 and then we just write my thoughts about formula one and it comes back to that passion again if you are passionate about something and you keep doing it then you will become good at it uh, so i think if you continually to pursue that excellence then uh you can you can keep you can keep at it and and you will you will only get better at it that's the beautiful thing and i i went out and i messed a few things up but obviously everyone always will you know you've got to go out there and fail uh sometimes um for me failure is the greatest teacher so you you learn from those failures and then you apply your new knowledge into the next thing mm. you do and um i was i was very lucky i was very lucky as well and anybody who gets to be in my position always is um so yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sit here and say oh i was just amazing and therefore i was destined for this no you need a you need a decent amount of luck um to be on your side and for me the fact that formula e had just sort of rolled around was very good because they were basically taking anyone in who oh, well. wanted to talk about 
they wanted to talk about Formula E. They weren't really in a position to say no to people. So I was like, so here's this new thing. Um, I'm going to go in there, make it my own, try and dominate it, you know, a little bit as best I can. And if I can build a nice little portfolio around this, show what I can do, then that's going to get people's attention. I can take it to people and say, this is what I've done here. Give me a job here and all these things. And so that's when, um, that's when I also joined the autosport um, sort of young writer thing they had at the at the time, which sadly is no longer a, a thing. Um, so, I actually I think I was on one of, one of like the last intakes, so I got in there just at the right time, um, and that put me on you know doing stuff for the magazine on the national uh, coverage. Um, so a mix between doing that and uh, going to formerly races when I could while working a part time job at a um, at a at a top man uh, as well um you know because you gotta you gotta make ends meet um but i kept doing it because i was passionate about it um so that 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 then pushed me into um the the pr uh route that i took as well yeah. because that was um that was that was where the the money and the jobs were at at the time not gonna lie um there was there was not a lot happening in motorsport journalism at the time. It's it's kind of changed quite a bit now, that that whole landscape. But um, you know, I I was offered a full time job in PR, so I took it. Learned an awful lot in in those four year four years that I was doing that as well for a couple of different agencies. And um, for, for for me, you know, doing everything that I have done in motorsport and being a motorsport expert, I think is is an important an important thing having a, a worldly view of motor racing because so many people come into to motor racing and they just see formula one and mm. they learn everything they can about formula one and then if they're feeling adventurous they'll all dip their toes into f2 or f3 um but if you want a proper worldly view you need to go and learn about le mans you need to go and learn about indycar and formula e and you know maybe a bit of rallying as well if you fancy it you know all these different series of gt you know racing series as well and learn about the Nurburgring 24 hours, the Spa 24 hours, things like that. Um, and for me, there's, you know, there's some of my favorite races you know, of the year. So um, I think, I think it's really important to maintain a, yeah, a much bigger picture of motorsport rather than just Formula One or just single seaters. Yeah. It, does, it doesn't sound like you, you're a lucky person, Chris. It sounds like you're actually generally interested in improving yourself <laughs> because, you know, not many people start writing blogs at 14. You know, I, I didn't, I, I didn't write a blog about cars. I was, I was interested. I didn't write a blog. I didn't mean probably because I was I didn't view myself as a writer. Maybe that's why. I don't know. But, you know, it seems like, you know, you've, you've spent time teaching yourself the craft of writing from 14, you know, whether, whether it's obvious to you at the time or not. And most people don't, don't think understand that, you know, it takes reps of a thing to become better like the gym. You know, you, you want to grow muscle, you do your reps, your biceps. But it sounds like, you you know, you've taught yourself writing at an early age. You've, you've taken opportunities like, you know, if someone had said to you, maybe a different Chris at a different time, do you want this autosport job? He might not have taken it. But because you were open to the opportunities and, and stuff as well, it sounds like you've actually, instead of being lucky, you've, you've taken the opportunities that have come to you. Does that, does that kind of resonate? Yeah, I mean, I was I was lucky to get those opportunities um, for sure because it a lot of the time it's about who you know, um, especially because that autosport one, I then found out about the PR job that I ended up taking through mm. my uh, people at autosport as well um, because you know they the guy who owned the agency would say to people at autosport, oh, have you got anybody on your young people you know roster that might be good at this? And so then they throw it to us. Um, yeah. So there is a there is a knock on effect of of how it happens, um, and especially because then you know people people that I met during Formula E helped me get other jobs um, as well. So you know I I often think about the the butterfly effect of of my life and whether if I if I were to start again, could I recreate the experiment that is my life and get to the same spot? Or, yeah. or would it veer off wildly? And I have, I have a feeling it would be very, very different if I wasn't in a particular place at a particular time, because, you know, there, there are so many of those just like chance meetings that end up giving you, uh, giving you an awful lot a long way down the, down the road. But yeah, I don't, I don't want to discredit myself too much because I feel like uh, I, you know, I have done well with the opportunities yeah. that have been presented. Um, with me um 
I certainly think when I was at Autospot, I probably didn't take advantage of it enough. Um, mm. But you know, a lot of us we were eighteen and pretty stupid, really. So uh, I think if I if I were to do that again, that's something I'd do. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, it, you gotta you gotta make advantage of the um, of the opportunities you have, and um, yeah, a little bit a little bit of luck in there is always is always going to be helpful. Yeah. So, I mean, for those I know, I, to be honest with you, I, as much as I love people, I know nothing about the careers they do. And I, I leave that for a reason because I like to find out from you what you do. I mean, so what PR commentating, mm-hmm. I know that you said they're all kind of linked in journalism as well. But if you were to explain to maybe, I don't know, a 16, 17 year old, you might be listening to this, um, hopefully. What is PR? Can you make it interesting and sound cool for someone that doesn't know what it is? And maybe they, they like writing and they didn't know that PR was an opportunity for them. What is it for you? Yeah, so when you're a journalist, um, most of the news you'll get will come from the PR people. So it's just another link in the chain of communication between brand and public, basically. And you've got <laughs> PR people and journalists in the middle somewhere. Um, so, but but obviously when you're a PR, the job you're trying to do is make it as easy as possible for the journalists so that ideally they can just take that story that you've written them copy and paste it onto their web and run the story and bam, done, easy, right? And then you can mm-hmm. take a box and say, right, nice, easy bit of coverage that we've managed to to get there. That's the communications side of things, which is what I worked on um, the most. But the truth is PR and marketing has so many different arms and avenues. So the last agency that I worked for that I recently left to pursue commentary um, full time um, has you know a, a communications department it has a digital it has social it has uh, research it has design it has uh, like event management hospitality all those kinds of um, things you know uh, like act- activation as well which is you know basically you know putting on events and act- activating partnerships um, between brands and, and and race teams or or um, uh, organizers championships um locations things like that um so there are so many opportunities in the world of pr and marketing which is, it's it's a very blanket term so uh, if you if you like you know social media then you can go and work on a, a brand's social media or a race team's social media if you like working with journalists then doing the communication stuff and I, i'd say that's where you know, again, it was handy to have that experience as a journalist when you've yeah. been on one end of the uh, of the um, the chain. Then you know when you move further up the link, you know what is needed further down, or what's going to catch the eye of a journalist and things like that. So um, that that experience was definitely very helpful. Uh, but there, are, yeah, there are so many different arms to to what marketing um, mm. is. So I I almost feel like if you've got a passion um, for for motor racing and for brands um and you know pushing uh their values then i i think you'll you'll quite happily find a job somewhere in marketing but you might have to move around a little bit and see what you're what you're good at but there's definitely I, there'll be a space for you yeah and so when did it get to the point where you're like i don't know you mentioned broadcasting and this is this is something i do want to talk about because again it's the facet of facet of motorsport that i have not touched on and you're the first person i've spoken to about it now to be honest, I'm really excited about you know what 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 I, what I want to find out. But for you, why did you make the leap? What was intrinsically interesting about broadcasting? Was it another challenge? Was it an opportunity that came up for yourself that you took? Why why go into the world of shouting about cars on on microphones? <laughs> um, so this all started um, a few years ago when I was doing national stuff with Autosport. I had the pleasure of being in the company of um ian soman who is one of the best commentators in the country um but you probably won't have heard of him because he sticks to club level racing um a lot of the time he's synonymous with the 750 motor club um which i was uh, covering for the magazine uh, at the time and i spent so i spent two years basically in commentary boxes listening to him and you know his craft um, and he's trained many other you know, young commentators who have gone on to do fantastic things. Um, 
And so one day I just said to him, so what, what is the secret of commentary? And he, he boiled it down to a few simple points. And I thought, oh, that, that sounds like it could actually be, you know, something I could I could do. And um, at um, on, on, on my podcast, on Missed Apex, we put together uh, karting events for our listeners. And put, bring together some of the panel, bring together a bunch of listeners. We all have a fun day karting. And um, uh, Spanners, the host, brought brought some speakers and a microphone to like call the action and not in a, a serious way or anything, but have a bit of fun with it. And basically he yeah. handed me this microphone. He said, go on, talk into that. I went, okay. Uh, <laughs> so I harken back to what Ian had taught me maybe a year or so prior and just started applying that. People start coming up to me and go, you're really good at this. Like really good at it. It sounds really pro. Mm. Like, oh, okay. All right. Fine. And so after that, you pick up another, another karting job. You pick up an esports uh, job, you know, things like that. I started to put together a show around. I actually really enjoy this. It's a lot of fun um, to be calling the action and to get people excited about, about what's happening out on track. But it didn't become uh, a viable thing until last year when I was signed by a uh, loudspeaker, mm. uh, which represents a number of different um commentators and hosts and broadcasters particularly in motorsport and i sent my show real to them on a whim like a complete whim it was rubbish yeah. it had it was full of these rubbish karting events and rubbish esports events that i'd done um but they clearly you know liked me uh from it brought me on and uh three months later i'm at the london epre doing the circuit commentary for the you know the the formerly race of the xl and I'm, I'm looking around thinking, what on earth <laughs> happened here? Like, who's, who's giving me the keys to this? This is yeah. a huge mistake. Um, and then uh, and then this year, we we went one better by getting a, a full season uh, commentary with the International GT oh. Open and its support series. So those are the, the main things that I've done uh, so far. Uh, and it's, again, it's funny how, you know, the, that, that butterfly effect that we were talking about earlier, how... Just somebody gave me a microphone at a casting event and suddenly I'm doing all these other things. And um, I, I just really enjoyed it. And it was getting harder and harder to juggle trying to do commentary and trying to do my full-time job in marketing as well. Yeah. And there had to come a point where I had to make a decision about what I valued more, what made me happier, and what was uh, a viable long-term plan um so once again i gave my parents a heart attack by you know quitting my full-time job and saying i'm gonna go and do freelance broadcasting because you know my job wasn't already you know wild enough uh and yeah. uh, <laughs> went to go yeah I've, I've, I've done that it's been it's only been about a month uh truth be told um but i'm enjoying the freelance life um at the moment uh it's it's a lot of fun uh and it's given me a lot more balance um and you i i find that you have to be uh, a very aware of how happy you are in your job in life in general because yeah. th there will come a point where you you kind of sit back and you go i'm just i'm not happy here anymore um and you know that's happened to me at other agencies it happened to me at a few places and that's when you decide you need to do something about that and to be honest it doesn't matter if it's been 10 years or 6 months you know, at yeah. this job, if you if you're unhappy there, then uh, do do something about it, and that's what I that's what I did. That's fantastic. I mean, I I, I did quite a similar thing, but I'll, I'll get onto that in a minute. But I am interested. You mentioned the three points of commenting. I'd be silly not to ask you what those are, or the things that you you were told and taught for people listening. And what for you? I mean, those things that you were taught in the 750 Mile Club and watching watching him. What, what, what were you taught there? What was what those lessons? Okay, I'm going to give away the trader secrets here. But for me, it comes down to when you're calling the action, points to hit, say that you, you got an overtake, you're calling the overtake. Who overtook who? Where did they do it? What place was it for? Hit those four marks, and then mm -hmm. that's clear cut and no room for misunderstanding there. The other one I, I learned was to always give yourself somewhere to go in terms of the excitement level. Because okay. let's say the, the thing with club racing is that you'll do 10 races 
on the bounce, short, sharp, 15 minutes, one right after the other. As soon as one ends, they get the next lot out for the next race. So there's no downtime. So what you would end up doing, if you started the, the first race, oh my God, this is amazing. And I've got about, I can't get any more excited than this. What happens if the next race is better? Where'd you, you go can't from there, yeah. relay. You can't relay that that additional excitement if you if you start at you know nine and a half out of ten. Yeah. Uh, so always give yourself a little bit of margin to go, and then when you get to the last race of the day, you can you can let yourself go a little bit and say, oh, this is a lot. This is a lot more fun, and you know it's the last race, so let's have a bit of fun with it. Interesting, because yeah, even if like even if that you know was just a motto for, you know, just do your job, you know, don't, don't go into your job full happy, you know, full energy right off the bat because you're going to be knackered by the end of the day. You know, it's something like releasing it slowly, like people are going to be able to tell if you're, I don't know, people are going to be able to tell if, you, if you're shouting the whole day, no one's going to, no one's going to find it genuine, are they? Because you're just portraying something that you I guess to most people isn't possible, which is just full blown excitement for the entirety of life. Yeah. I mean, I I try and put across a genuine passion for racing in my commentary um, because sometimes you'll listen to commentators and they just they sound bored. They they don't sound at all interested um, in a race. I'm not like calling anyone out here or anything, but um, <laughs> for, for me, it's about the passion. Mm. Um, so not to the point where I'm just screaming into a microphone, you know, f- throughout the entire race, um, but. I, I try and provide, you know, added context and also enjoyment for the viewer. Yeah. And how did you, how did you find the happiness when you, when you found like looking at marketing going, cause we got to go back to that actually, because it was quite interesting. You said, you know, you get to the point where you're looking at life and going, you know, maybe, maybe this job isn't for me, you know, maybe that isn't because that feeling happens in every job and every transition ever. Like I, I was in hospitality. I didn't really like doing it. I was there because it paid well for my age anyway. And so I, I took the jump of having a nice solid full-time job and I went for part-time and now I'm doing this and other stuff and it's fantastic. But how did you decide to make the jump? How did you decide that maybe your happiness is more important to you than the paycheck? Oh, that happiness was more important. Um, I think, I, think I, I realized, first of all, uh, how much I was making you know, just from, from doing commentaries. And I thought to myself that the first thing I thought of was if I did X number of these things a month, I'd be making the same money I am now. Does that sound like a viable thing I could do? Yes, it does. And Mm. this makes me very happy. The genuinely, it was, it was going to, going to, you know, a race weekend and, Feel, I was on cloud nine. I was so happy um, being there. You know, you're surrounded by race cars. I'm surrounded by people who share my passion. And then I get to talk about my passion for a living. When I would come back to the office, okay, it was still related to my passion, but it was a lot more intense, let's mm. put it that way, um, and less fun. I think that's fair to say. Um, so when it, when it came down to it, I, I said that, my yeah my happiness was more important to me than right now the amount of money i was making yeah. and again we talk about luck i'm in a very fortunate position to be able to make that choice uh so i took advantage of that fact um i know not everybody is in the, the same position it is a position of luxury i'll admit um but if you if you can um sacrifice a bit of income for what makes you happy then I think your overall quality of life will just increase. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe I'm talking from a privileged position uh, here, but I've certainly found that to be the case. Yeah. I mean, I spoke to someone who was a uh, bus driver before he became a Valkyrie Aston Martin technician. And, you know, he wasn't exactly in a privileged place, but he still was able to, you know, make the transition from bus driver to, working with cars that he'd grown up around Warwickshire with and it is you know whether you're maybe you know on a privileged position mm. I know I live at home so I was it, like that tr- transition thing was quite easy to make you know I was quite easy to go I, I'm supported by my family got a roof over my head I'm very lucky so I, I made I made the leap because when I when I when else am I going to, have to do that but yeah and I understand I sound with me like for some people it may seem impossible but at the end of the day I guess it's just time isn't it 
time management and, and knowing that you know it might take me a bit longer to reach my dream because I need a bit more help, you know, financially or whatever it is. But yeah, I think it is possible for anyone to to move regardless of privilege. Yeah, I, I'd I'd like to think it's it's possible for anyone. Mm. Uh, I I think again, if you if you have a passion for it and you pursue it, then and but you pursue it, you know, relentlessly, then chances are at some point it's going to pay off for you. Um, and and you know maybe somewhere down the road you have to say, okay, this isn't working, but I gave it a but I gave it a shot. Mm. Um, but you know the people people with the talent and a passion should pursue those things because for me it's 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 found me uh a role i love um and great people in my life um and uh you know a a good life that i'm that i'm very happy with um it's taken me a while to get there you know there were a few hits and misses along the way but ultimately i would i would say i'm extremely excited about what my long-term future holds mm. now because we're already planning uh, next year and you know i've had to say to my agent you know right we really gotta hit the ground running next year now because i ain't got a job to fall back on if this doesn't go well yeah so we have to we have to make this work um now and you know t- to be honest they're the ones finding me these jobs as well you know i i may well have a talent for this sort of thing if you want to say that but at the end of the day i didn't have the context to go and make it happen and that's the beauty of um loudspeaker as well and they've done the same thing for so many different um people in in a similar position to me where you know they say you're really good at this we're going to plonk you here uh, and you know you're going to nail that for for a year and uh, you know we'll, we'll see what what happens in the in the next couple of years no, fantastic. Well, that is, uh, you've kind of led me on to my next question because I, I constantly, I do plan a lot, quite a bit. Like you say, if you're planning on making, hit the ground running, it's something that some people don't do and some people just, you know, go with the flow. But I'm, you know, I like to hit goals. I like to set goals. You know, this part, I think is helpful for me. I know I, I, know, I thrive, thrive off it and it can be exciting. You know, you can be excited thinking about the future and where you can be in five, 10 years or, you know, the job you can have, or, you know, could you be the next Martin Brundle for you? I don't know. Who knows? But for you, like, what is that that progression? What do you say if I were to, to you, Chris? Whatever you want will happen to you in the next X amount of years. What is that goal? What is that big lofty ambition for you to hit? So I think the primary goal is just to be able to fully make money by talking about motorsport for a living, mm. whether that is doing commentaries or hosting things or corporate events, you know, panels. Yeah, whatever. I, I do enjoy doing those things. But the th- what I said to my agent when uh, she asked me a similar question when I signed on for them, she said, what, what, what's your ultimate ambition? I said, I want to be this generation's David Addison. <laughs> so if you know David Addison, the commentator, um, he is everywhere. He is never not calling something on a race weekend between GT World Challenge, between British touring cars, between all sorts of other you know things. He is everywhere. And I thought, what a life that that must be. Um, just hopping from racetrack to racetrack and um, being surrounded by race cars on a permanent basis, it seemed like. <laughs> so um, I, would, I would say I want to be like David Addison in the future. Mm. What does that what does that mean to you? I know, I know you can say it doesn't it, does it mean you can travel more. Does it mean you're like you'll be able to see more of the world? What does that you know that vision? What does that bring out for you when you think about it? Well, the travel is kind of incidental, um, mm. really. I mean, honestly, if it was all UK based, I'd be very happy with that. Um, this is this is going to sound um, this is going to sound awful, but I hate traveling. Um, I hate airports i hate planes i hate the whole process um once i'm there it's lovely and i'm having a great time but that bit in the middle where it's it's airport airplane yeah. airport it's just i can't stand it it's 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 the worst part about it and right now uh, i'm not doing too much traveling like i've done six or seven things abroad this year maybe a bit more uh, next year that may well increase um quite a lot 
but um you know i i did a fair bit of the travel when i was doing formula e um journalism uh, as as well that was once every three four weeks going to uh, a race and um i didn't do i didn't do all of them um because we didn't have budget for all of them um, yeah. it was mainly the european ones and then like one fly away um as well which would usually be towards the end of the season because they used to end the season in like new york or montreal or something like that so you do one of those um but uh yeah to, yeah to me the travel is <laughs> is incidental and you don't often get to see that much while you're out there it's very much airport racetrack hotel racetrack hotel airport <laughs> that's your weekend um so you have to you have to make a like dedicated effort to stay out there for a little bit and obviously while i had a full-time job that was a lot harder but uh i suppose now i could very easily say you know oh let's, let's keep the hotel for another couple of nights and stay in barcelona or you know portimao or wherever um for for a little bit um i suppose that's how you would you would also try and try and make it work but you know it's i i i i, I talk about this on the on the show when i when we talk about formula one the sheer number of races they have to do um now and it's the people working in formula one i feel really sorry for because it's just relentless and they're never at home and you know i do think there is a fine balance to be drawn there between getting yourself to to races but also getting to spend a little bit of time at home with either with family or you know friends or your flatmates whoever you, you know whoever you live with whoever makes you happy really yeah that's interesting it's a nice insight because i think maybe people can glamorize f1 and motorsport as this thing that you know you get jet set all over the world that's why i mentioned travel because i just imagine you know you're quite happy to pop on a plane go to barcelona and come back pop on a plane go to moscow pop on a, well probably not now that's probably a bad, bad country to pick but um, but yeah you got to go anywhere you want but yeah it's interesting that you just to figure out that Actually, you know, you think about F1 and they're, they're going through so many races a year, being traveling with, you don't actually get time at home. Is, is, that, is that something that's important to you then, Chris, is, is time with time with loved ones? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I, I've, I know it can, it can get to you eventually if you're spending all that time on the, on the road. I mean, I used to talk to people, even in Formula E, when their calendar was a lot less compact than, than Formula One, but they were obviously still spending quite a fair bit of time on the road um together and there is something nice in it you know it's kind of got you know 80s band on tour um you know or circus on tour you know vibes um about it um but at, at the end of the day I, I think yeah coming home and and you know home comforts and uh being with being with loved ones that is still really important uh, so th there is a balance um, to be struck there, uh, and I don't think it's in Formula One's interest to do that. Um, uh, but I think if we if we're going to talk about Formula One specifically, then I think yeah, th there's got to be some stuff done about that. Whether you know whether we're talking about rotational staff, which suddenly has you know problems in and of itself uh, as as well. I mean, put it to you this way, there would, there would be people in the office at my old agency that I wouldn't see for like two or three weeks just because they were away uh, doing, you know, to, to Grand Prix on consecutive uh, race weekends. And something, you know, like a few months will go down the line, you're saying, like, I ain't seen you in ages. What are you doing? They just go, well, work. <laughs> uh, and for me, there, there's there's got to be more to life than the work, you know? Even when mm. you love your job, even I've been I've been sitting here this whole show saying how lucky am I to be doing the thing I'm passionate about and I absolutely love and it's wonderful and all this, but even with the things you are most passionate about, you have to moderate it, otherwise you will get fatigued and you will wear yourself out. And again, I'm going to use Formula One as an example here because uh, I am I'm, I'm still really passionate about Formula One itself. But the fact that we are relentlessly being thrown races, what feels like every weekend now, you get bored of it. Mm. Or actually, here's a good the good the good example as well was uh, Star Wars when Disney <laughs> bought it and they chucked out a movie every year. And okay, the first one everyone loved it, you know the the Force Awakens, and then uh, Rogue One came out, best Star Wars movie ever made, and then. Uh, 
what was the uh, rise of no what was the Ken, last Ken jedi Toe. that was it <laughs> last jedi and the people were going mm. Mm. and then solo comes out and people are going oh, i'm bored of this now we didn't ask for this uh but you've made it and no one really cares about it that's the point we're at i think with, <laughs> with formula one yeah i think they did the same thing with marvel didn't they when they changed up the um after sort of you know they took, the, they took the characters out and they started doing their own thing. But I see what you mean with, with Star Wars. It's an interesting thing that you give people too much of anything. Mm. They get bored of it or too much, they get sick. You know, you get, eat too much chocolate, you're going to probably throw up. You know, it's the same same concept. Instead yeah. of just, you consume too much content and TikTok, you find yourself fatigued because you you have too much dopamine going through your brain because you're swiping so much. Yeah, I, can, I completely get it. Um, but Chris, we are at the point where I get to ask you some five quick questions. Um, and the first of those being, what is your ultimate three car garage? Okay. Ultimate three car garage, uh, Aston Martin DB nine. I've loved that since I was like a kid. Um, probably a track day type of car, like a, not a caterum, uh, something, something cooler than a caterum, uh, like one of those track day Porsches that they make. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. An Atom. That's a good, yeah, yeah. That's a good shout. And then um, some sort of Porsche, like a nice mm. cruising Porsche, because I like Porsches. Yeah, there's nothing better than a Porsche. I think if you ask anyone that's remotely interested in cars, I think Porsche is the pinnacle. It's just a shame they don't make more supercars, because I think that'd be fantastic. But um, there we go. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and the next, the next question, Chris, is you have one car to drive on any road or track, but you can only do, only do it once. Where would you go and what would you take? Uh, Nurburgring, for sure. The Nordsch life. Uh, I've, been, I've been driven around there by uh, my mate, who's a two-time class champion of the Nurburgring. And that place is just an absolute beast roller coaster. There was one point uh, where it felt like my body was being turned inside out during a compression <laughs> point, about a third of the way around the lap, um, which was a lot of fun. Uh, what would I? What would I drive? Um, uh, probably if if I if I could like a like a GT4 uh, race Ooh. car, yeah. um, because they're 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 quite amateur friendly. I feel like it's the one thing I wouldn't kill myself in <laughs> if I were to be unleashed on a track. Yes. So the same, so you know, a bit more friendly than a. Because I went round in my mate in my own like yeah in my own daily driver just because I did like quick trip with some friends and I think it's the best thing and I I, I will I will preach this to the day I die. Um, but yeah, Chris, this this podcast is for you know it, it its main aim is to inspire those who have a passion to do more with that passion. And this question I find really sort of nails down who you are as a person. If you were to do anything in the world, right, anything you want, and money no money is no object, what would you do for a living? What would I do for a living? I mean, this, mm. yeah. right? Like, uh, I would any way to be talking or writing about motor racing. Uh, that is, that is it. Um, mm. It's, it's, it'd be yeah. If if money was absolutely no object at all, I'd be going mad uh, with it. I'd be doing like so many more crazy things <laughs> than than what I was planning to, um, uh, than what I am doing. But uh, yeah, pretty much this. What would those crazy things be out of interest? Like, well, if you could 10x your career, what would they be? Oh, Matt, I'd like, I'd like come up with like a TV series where I just like ham cars around like nice roads or racetracks. Uh, or I'd do things where I just like, let's, let's see if I can get my mate to drop, you know, five seconds in lap time, uh, having never driven a race car before, um, or been on a track before, or I would just, go karting all the time and make a series of that one thing i really really want to do and this is the 750 motor club's fault because i've been around them for so many uh years now and it is probably the cheapest way to go proper circuit racing in the country mm. um for me they offer the best value for money racing in the country probably in the world um and every time i go down there uh, and I'm like, oh, I should, I should buy like a Formula V car or something, or I should get like, like this Civic and enter it in their endurance uh, series. And I'm like, oh, how can I do? Oh, I've got to get a sponsor. And then, you know, I'll, I'll say to my mate who's a racing driver, like, do you want to come and do this endurance series thing? And you know, we'll we'll do it together, and you can like coach me, and we'll make a YouTube series out of it. That to me 
that's like ultimate. I would love to do that. No, nice. Well, what's what's stopping you? Money. That's it. <laughs> that's in the air because it costs money to go racing. Um, and even if even with the cheapest like series in the world, you know, you've still got to first of all, you know, get the get the arts test, get your race kit sorted, um, you know, all the things to get the license, and then to actually get going racing. Okay, then I've got to buy a car. Mm. That's the most expensive part of it. It's like, well, I could buy a car and run it myself, which probably wouldn't be a good idea because I'm not in any way mechanically gifted. Um, or I can pay a team to run my car for me. Oh, well, that's still going to cost me a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, wait, I've got to buy a new set of tires for when the other ones go pop. Uh, I've got to pay the entry fee. Oh, am I going to pay for the full season? I don't know if I'm going to do the full season. But if I do it race by race, that's much more expensive. Uh, and then, oh, God, I've got to buy this these toolkits and all these other, you know, all these other bits. And you're like, oh, God, oh, now the engine's blown. I've got to buy a new engine. And it, it will just stack up so, so quickly. So that to me is where the money is no object bit would would <laughs> come into it. But, you know, if anybody's listening to the show and wants to sponsor my career uh, <laughs> to, to go racing, then uh, give us a shout. Uh, <laughs> that's the only way it's going to happen. No, fantastic. No, yeah, exactly. That's one of the things I, I I learned very quickly doing this podcast and speaking to racing drivers was that you know money is the one thing that seems to you know, accelerate everything in this world dramatically. Mm. Is, you know, have you got enough cash? It's a shame. And it's the same with like every sport as well you know I've, I've i've spoken to pro golfers and you know pro players and other things and they all say the same thing it's like and unless you are uh like in the top four for example in a golf tournament you are b- not making any money on that you're lucky to break even mm. so and it, yeah it's a shame that that's how sport works but that is the reality of it yeah no, it's, it's one of those things where you need you need you need a world full of money to do anything in this life. And I think it's it's a sh- it's a shame that more people don't help other people out. But you know, it's kind of why what I plan to do in the future, you know, if I can. So, but yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's one one step at a time. Um, you can't feel you can't feel an ice's cup if yours is empty. That's one thing I like the sound of. Um, but yeah, uh, Chris. Yeah. If you could give advice to a younger you or someone that wants to you know pursue their passion, what would it be? Uh someone who wants to pursue their passion, uh, go out and fail, um, but learn from the failings. Failure is the greatest teacher. That's a Yoda quote as well. <laughs> Coming back to Star Wars. Um, um, but just, yeah, in, enjoy the passion and, you know, get out there and muck it up a few times, but get back up on the horse and just keep going. Um, and if you if you keep at it, then you will become good at it and eventually you'll be able to make something uh, of it. Fantastic. And the last question, what would you love most about cars? Uh, what do I love most about cars? Um, noise. Uh, this is uh, probably more racing specific, but drama. Um, and rivalry with respect which I think is probably the ultimate in, in motor racing. Because when you're doing something dangerous like motor racing, there has to be respect. Uh, and I I like the fact that on a almost weekly basis, I see drivers go out on track, knock seven bells out of each other uh, in terms of like wheel-to-wheel combat. Uh, and then they get out of the car and they, you know, they shake hands, they're fist pumping, they're you know, they're, they're friends and they say, oh, you got me there. You know, oh, but I managed to get you back and all that. That to me is just, that's elite. Nice. Brilliant. Uh, well, Chris, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to you know, hear more about your career, why, why you do what you do. Um, but yeah, and hopefully someone listening to this has uh, picked a push on for broadcasting, listening to you. So, uh, I hope so. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun, um, but I hope not too many people get inspired, become better than me and uh, start pricing me out of this job. <laughs> Because I need it, so uh, but no, keep keep at it because um, it's a lot of fun. When we work in motorsport, there's gen- genuinely there's there's no like better group of friends you will probably make than working in motorsport together. <laughs>